There's a bumper. I know there's a bumper. There's a bumper. There it is. Good morning. This is the message I was going to give last week, but the Middle East kind of steered me in that direction. But in this sermon, we're going to explore the initial call of Jesus to his disciples and what that means for us, too, to be called into discipleship. So let's pray first. Heavenly Father, open up our hearts to fully understand the call of discipleship and the sacrifices that go along with it. And help us to grasp the rewards that await us when we choose to follow you. Guide us, Lord, as we strive to be more like Jesus every day. Okay. In his book, Follow Me, A Call to Die, A Call to Live, David Platt says, and it should be up on the screen somewhere, mm -mm -mm -mm. making disciples of Jesus is the overflow of the delight in being disciples of Jesus. I like that because it's not canned. It, it's just an overflow of the joy of the Lord. And I would say that if you're a Christian, discipleship in Jesus Christ is the core of who we are. And if you've been around church for any amount of time, you probably heard the word disciple thrown around. And it's, a, it's an old word that just means a, a learner who follows a master teacher. The identity of Christ, who Christ is and who we are in him, that's at the core of the whole thing. And if, if you get that right, if you don't get it right, everything else will be kind of blurred. So it's important. And in contrast to our Western era here, learning in Jesus' time was very relational and very holistic. You would follow the rabbi around, and you would watch, you would watch him put his teachings in action on the day-to-day -day of his life. You know, discipleship was more than just a transfer of information. It was something completely different. It referred to imitating the teacher's life. I, I kind of think when I'm talking about this, I'm thinking of the martial artist with the sensei. You know, you follow them around, you incorporate their values in a whole bit, and you reproduce their teachings, each one teaching one. So Christian discipleship implies a relationship with a master teacher following them and hearing to their way of life. And it's twofold, it is. Um, it's about leaving behind what we know and embracing the incredible rewards and, incredible, and this incredible new life in Christ. All, all of Jesus, all of your life, it's all in. So there's... And you, know, you can have as much God as you want. I mean, there's people that will come to church every Sunday, but then there's a disciple thing, and, that's, and I'll get to it. We'll talk about it. But we're going to explore that over the next few weeks. And being a disciple, doing a discipleship could cost, end up costing you everything. How's that for promo for the next couple of weeks? <laughs> but don't worry. Um, Steve Lawson says, the demands of following Christ will cost you everything, but you gain far more than you give up. He said, you give up dirt for diamonds. I like that. That's a great saying. It's a solid investment strategy, right? Get be dirt for diamonds. I'll take that. The Apostle Paul, who was all that, Pharisee of Pharisees, crossed every T, dotted every I, studied under Gamaliel, so kind of went to Harvard for Pharisees, you know, and um, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, which basically means ravenous wolf in Hebrew, and sir, he certainly was. But he said that every human achievement he ever had before Christ, before that Damascus Road experience, he counted as utter garbage. Wow. It just completely changed him. So the call for discipleship, I've been talking about calls for probably a, a month and a half or so. It's not a suggestion or a request. It's, it's, a, it's a compelling command to abandon your old ways and embrace new life in Christ. And it starts with a call or it starts with a desire, I think. I think there's a desire there, and then there's a call. 
It's like a divine summons. And it stirs something deep within you, and it awakens your spirit. And that call is to leave behind the familiar and venture into the unknown. When God called Abram, I talked about that last week, he said, Abram, get you and your people, come follow me to a land that you do not know. He didn't know what was going on. He's like, okay, Lord, I'll follow you, you know, but it's, it's a call to surrender your life to Christ and follow him wholeheartedly. Here's how it looked for two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. So if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew 4 or look on the screen or hit, a, hit your Bible app. Those of you at home, however you'd care to look at the scriptures, we're glad you're here. As Jesus was walk, walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Jesus. <laughs> that was good timing, actually. Uh, at once, they left their nets and they followed him. At once, immediately. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and brother of John. I noticed they call him son of Zebedee here. Um, they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately, <laughs> they left their nets and, and their father, and they followed him. Whew. Nothing is more important than following Christ when you think about it. Uh, in the passage, he's calling his first disciples their ordinary men. They're the salt of the earth, fishermen by trade. Does anybody here know any professional fishermen that do it for a living? I know a few of them. I grew up with a few of them. They're characters, you know, but they love what they do. They're out on the water, and then they come back, and they get a boatload of money, and then they go out on the water again. You know, it's, but they're just doing their day-to-day -day tasks, and Jesus called them immediately. They left their nets and they followed them. They didn't hesitate. They didn't make any excuses. Uh, well, you know, let me finish this first, Jesus, or let me go consult with my family. And it's not like they abandoned their family because as you see, son of Zebedee, the mom went and followed them around for a while. That's when they started calling them sons of thunder. So I got a feeling mom was thunder. She tried to shoehorn each of them in on Jesus' left and right. But they simply dropped everything and followed Jesus. And that's the essence of the call of discipleship. It's an immediate response to an invitation. Every cell in your body will respond when it hits you, if it hits you like that. It's also radical transformation. When he said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, he's calling them to a new vocation and a new purpose. Now, I'm not saying you have to quit your job and all of that, but I'm just saying you can see there's a completely different makeover here. They're not going to catch fish anymore. They're not going to tend their nets anymore. Although they couldn't enjoy going out fishing and all, of course, he didn't say stop that. But now they're going to catch people for the kingdom of God. Wow. So discipleship's not just about following him. It's about becoming like him, Christ-like, and participating in his mission. Kind of a holistic overhaul, so to speak. Where a lot is going to be sacrificed, a lot is going to be gained. When James and John heard the call, they left their boat and dad. <laughs> and they're like, let's go left their source of income, think about it, right? Their family, their security, everything that was familiar and comfortable, and they left, they walked out of their comfort zone completely. And they chose to follow Jesus, leaving everything behind. Discipleship requires a willingness to trade my dream for my life for God's dream for my life, and then submit to God's will. And ultimately, it's so much better, and you'll find that out as you get involved in it, but it also could be a huge sacrifice depending on your life and your situation. You know, I mean, for me, <laughs> I didn't think of it, any of it as a sacrifice. Those of you that are in any type of recovery programs, um, oh, I gave all that up. Well, thank you. What'd you give up? Hugging a toilet bowl? You know, <laughs> seriously. And, and the way I was living back then, I mean, I walked away from it. Yeah, I embraced a whole new life. And some people don't have that experience, I get that. You know, but, but there was a joy too that came along with it because whatever I had before, none of it mattered anymore. And I had all that, you know, I had, I was living pretty large at the time and it's okay to have things. I don't think it's so much of a material thing that you're walking away from, but it's okay to have it all, just don't let it all have you, right? Um, but I noticed that everything that I was building before Christ I was building my own little identity and kingdom. You know, let's get this kind of furniture. Let's get these cereals. Let's drive this kind of car. It was all 
What was I doing? That, was, that, I thought, was making me who I was. But then when I found out who I was in Christ, wow, everything changed. Yeah, and we all have stories of sacrifice, but I want to be clear. It's not about the things you give up. It's also about embracing the reward of this, the new life in Christ. Jesus promised them that they would become fishers of men. So they're going to participate in the greatest mission of all time, really. I mean, it's the ultimate road trip. <laughs> so I feel I have the greatest job in the world. I really do. It's demanding, and it can be very stressful at times, um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Bringing people to Jesus, bringing Jesus to people. And if you can't get people, get, if you can't get people to come to church, bring the church to them. It's the same thing. You know, that's why we do outreach. It's helping, and part of, most of my ministry has been helping those who have been damaged in other churches. I'm not saying you're not going to get damaged here because I'm not perfect, but if, if I do something to hurt, you come talk to me about it. It's not intentional, right? But I want to try to get their footing back and regain that relationship with Christ. The disciples, when you think, they had the privilege of walking with Jesus, learning from him, experiencing his power, and his presence in their lives while he was here. I mean, that's incredible. And, and this shows that while it's demanding, it can be incredibly rewarding too. Jesus had three meetings after the resurrection. First, he called his disciples to him. Then he appeared to 500. So he kind of had a meeting with the 500. And then there's something for us too, because he said, all authority in heaven has been given unto me. All authority in heaven and earth, I'm sorry. Meaning, that's it. I'm the ultimate reality here. And then he gave them the great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he included us in the meeting because he said, Lo, I'll be with you always until the ends of the age. Wow. So, I mean, they were called, Christians were called disciples before they were called Christians. The way, you know, they were called the way for a while, but Jesus called them disciples. And then in Antioch, they became the first word Christian was born. But it's a call like, to me that every believer has to answer. You can have as much God as you want. You really can. You know, it's, it's really, that's why I said that's where the desire comes in and then the call comes in. But you want to follow and become, become Christ-like? Wow. I mean, we trade our dream for his dream and our life for his, what, what's going on with him, and things will be very different you got to hold on loosely and let go. I didn't even think about letting go. It wasn't a, an issue. And those things, when I was after them, they meant everything to me. But that's how much of the transformation happened. The call was immediate, and, the, and it, it requires an immediate response. It does when it happens. And I've always told you, it's a willingness to sign your name on the blank piece of paper and let God fill it, the whole blank in. Let him fill it in. And that's embracing new life in Christ. This is what's on the table. I mean, in our passage in Matthew, they all left their vocations and their ways of life, and they left their families, but they didn't abandon them. You know, Peter was still in touch with his mother-in-law, still in touch. He was married, of course. Um, they still connected, um, but it was the ultimate road trip. It's almost like being in a band. You know, I'm going out on tour. When are you going to be back? When the tour's over? <laughs> but we see the, mo the mother of James and John followed them. In our passage from Matthew, again, they left everything, but you have to be willing, you have to be willing to abandon your old way of life. And maybe you're comfortable with your old way of life. But that's what I mean. It won't be like a, a line in the sand, but it'll just be a new nature coming over you, and those things won't matter to you too much anymore, you know, and you're as you're embracing this new life. Not a call to physical abandonment, more of a call to spiritual and emotional one. That's about letting go of the worldly attachments. Don't let them have you. Also working through your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups. Work through them. You might have to get a counselor. It's okay. Everybody needs a tune-up every now and then. You know, and, and then putting, let's face it, we all have selfish desires and we all have self-centered ambitions. We're born with it. But it's putting them in check. You know, and it's about surrendering our will to God's will, our plans to God's plans, and our dreams to God's dreams. And the Holy Spirit does that for you. We don't play tug of war with these things. You know, it's C.S. Lewis, I, one of my favorites. You know, he's a great writer, theologian. He said this, 
the Christian does not think God will love us because we're good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Isn't that freeing? Wow. I would always pray, Lord, please cause me to will and to do according to your good purpose, which is a scripture verse. But I took me out of the equation. Lord, cause me to will. When I read that verse, I was like, whoa. So I started praying on it. Now, and the quote that C.S. Lewis said, it reminds us that it's not about being good enough to earn God's love. That's not what it is. It's not about doing enough to earn his love either. It's about surrendering to the love and allow him to transform us from the inside out. It's like the, let the mainspring get changed. And he's the only one that could do that. The therapist isn't going to do that. The self-help books are only going to get you so far. But the mainspring needs to be changed. And it's about letting go of our self-efforts and self-righteousness and piety and relying on God's grace and mercy. And I love to hear him when he calls. You know, it's dying to self and living for Christ. I didn't do things for my parents because I was afraid I'd have my head handed to me. Well, sometimes I did. Dad was a little heavy-handed. Mom could, mom could throw down with the best of them, too. <laughs> but I did it because I knew they would be touched when I did it. You know, I'd always hook up with my mom when I, after I moved out and everything. Whenever it was a birthday, I always took her out for lunch. It was just me and her. And it was something very special. But I just knew, I knew it would really please her and really make a special day. You know, so what we do can be costly at times, discipleship, but again, the reward far outweighs the loss. You know, it's the eternal promise far exceeds the temporary possibilities that'll be here today and gone tomorrow. And then you'll be hungry for the next thing. It's like trading dirt for diamonds. And, and when we think of rewards, our minds usually go to material stuff like the car or worldly possessions or the trophies and tangible objects. And it's okay to reward yourself. You know, I'm not saying you need to do without, but, but the rewards of following Jesus are so much richer than what we just gain materially. You know, it's more profound than anything the world could possibly offer you. And there's several tangible things that we get and we can experience when we follow him. So the first one is a, a transformed life, as I've been saying. When we choose to follow Jesus, we're not just adding religious, a religious aspect to our life. This is so important. You know, it's not about, okay, I got a bunch more rules and I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do the ritualistic, stand up and sit down in the whole bed. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.17 says, the old passed away, the new has come. Therefore, anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Gone in the Greek means destroyed. But let's face it, the messy room is still there. It needs to be cleaned up. So it's not just about changing our behavior. That's important to understand. It's not behavior modification, but it's a complete makeover of your mind, heart, and your spirit. And the behavior will come. You know, and along, when you get a new heart, when a new heart, so the, the, Holy, the poison spirit of Adam is replaced by the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, new motivations come and new purpose comes. God re completely rekindled my love for playing music. I lost it. You know, as a secular musician, I, I, I let the business end of it destroy me. I'm like, well, they're getting 20%, the, the agency. Oh, the manager's getting 10 or 15. Then you got to play the promo guy. Then you got to buy the truck. Then you got to pay for the insurance. Then you got to pay for the roadies. Right, Pete? By the time they get to you, <laughs> and they're sending you all over the world, and your relationships are going, gunk, 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 gunk. You know, it's just... You have to have a special woman um, that understands this, that can deal with it, because you're just not there a lot. But my pastor, he goes, you know what, Chuck? I, when I came up there, he goes, I was praying at Gus Stump. It was a specific place that he prayed for at. And he showed me his journal. And he opens it up, and he goes, here, look. And he goes, praying about the new band for Israel. And then he put in quotes, Chuck for drummer? And then he put a scripture verse under that from Isaiah. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. And it's like the Lord brought me up there for a whole, you know, and I, I just looked at it. And I, within a nanosecond, I said, I'm in. <laughs> and I stayed in for 10 years. But the joy of music came completely back because now I had a new motivation and a new purpose. It wasn't the business end of it anymore. 
it was creating a bridge from my heart to theirs that Jesus could walk across, you know, and God was using it. It was pretty incredible. I had a brand new life. Then I was asked to join the worship team, which was a natural progression. And I got, and musicians that are playing, hear me, when I got done, I would come down, and it was such an honor and a privilege to do that, to stand in intercession between the congregation and the Lord. I wanted to get on my knees, and tears were coming out of my eyes. That's how I felt about it. The music was sacred. There was something very special from playing the secular thing I was doing to what I was doing now. It was a complete makeover, holistic makeover. But it, you, what you do is you worship while you're playing. It wasn't just playing and reading notes. It was worshiping and expressing myself. I could still perform, but I was expressing myself. But it was, I was giving it to God and letting God put it out. It takes a while to do that. It takes a while to get that with musicians. It does. To be spiritually mature and, and a good player. It, but God will use it, man. Um, when Jesus called his disciples, he gave them a new purpose. My purpose has been completely transformed to where I was before. I'm a fisher of men. I'm a shepherd. Uh, I'm a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats. With the size of our church, I can be a shepherd, not a rancher. You know, if we got into, if we grew into a mega church, I'd have to be a rancher. I don't like that. But anyway, they're no longer catching fish for a living. Now they're involved in eternal business of saving souls. But their training, which I had training too, their training as fishermen would come in handy on the open seas of life. My training as a musician is what pulled me into where I was. He who wins souls is wise and will shine like the stars. Wow. That's a proverb. That's in Proverbs 11, I believe. So in addition to transformation of purpose, you can also look forward to an intimate relationship with God. I mean, come on. It gets no better than that. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this, but this is how the Lord worked with me. Uh, there was nothing better for me than sitting on the edge of the Sea of Galilee before the sun came up. And coming out there and having some tunes and bringing a journal and bringing some scripture and, and then putting them down and watching the Lord hold court when creation came alive. Because the sun, the sun would pop up over the mountains and just it seemed like a beam of water would hit the water and wherever you were standing came right over to you or wherever you were sitting. And the birds were flying by in pairs, and the fish were coming up to feed. And I'm reading a scripture verse that says all that. I'm like, whoa. And to, it wasn't just a sunrise. God was holding court. It was incredible. So that, that changed my life. It really did. The creation bears witness to his glory. And that's where I learned we follow Jesus not to just add a set of rules and doctrines and dogma. No, this, I mean, those are guardrails. We need them, Right? But we're entering into a personal relationship with the living God. I like the word guardrails because a lot of times when we go out of those, we get hurt and it's keeping us in check. But we get to know him, we get to love him, and we get to experience his love for us. What could be better than that? Seriously. You know, we could talk to him in prayer, we could listen to him in his word, experience his presence in our lives here and now. You know, I mean, and it's not just for here and now, also, it's an everlasting relationship. Remember, he promised his followers in John 3, 16, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And it's not just about living forever. It's about, again, here and now too. It's the here and not yet. Experience the fullness of life, more and better life than you ever dreamed of, Jesus said, in the presence of God. Freed, with a D, past tense, freed from sin, freed from sorrow, freed from death. You know, eternal life begins the moment we choose to follow Christ, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And let's face it, there's obstacles and difficulties. There are. But in the age to come, there's freedom. Because this planet's fallen, it's a, you know, it's broken. Nothing really works right. But the book of Revelation tells us this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or sorrow or crying. Nor shall there be any more pain. And that includes prob no more problems, no more worries, no more angst. All of that gone forever. Think about it. What an incredible promise of things to come. And what a compelling reason to answer the call. But remember, <laughs> Jesus fed over 5,000. Only 500 followed him after they had lunch. The crowd totally thinned out after that. 
He had 12 disciples, but only three went a little bit further with him in the garden. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, he only took the three. And then only one stood with him at the cross. It seems like the closer you get to the cross, the smaller the crowd gets, right? So to wrap it up, it's hard to imagine how the first disciples felt when they heard the voice of Jesus calling out to them. Come, follow me. Let's face it, if we were done and when you guys walked outside and somebody was out there, you didn't know them, and said, hey, come here, follow me. You'd come running back in here and say, Pastor Chuck, call the cops. <laughs> There's somebody strange outside. You know, it's, it's kind of mysterious and a little odd. We'd probably think something was wrong with them. It's a frightening invitation to say the least. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, there's an amazing exchange with Eslan the Lion. And the beaver is talking to somebody, and he says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good, I tell you. He's the king. Wow. Now, I can't promise you that following Jesus will be easy and make everything okay in your life. It's not going to be all sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns. It's not, I'm sorry. But in fact, some things might even get a little harder, a little more difficult. But I can tell you with full confidence that he is the king. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and he's the door by which we enter. And choosing to follow Jesus will be the best decision you can ever make in this life. We'll talk more about it in the upcoming weeks, what it means to be a disciple and why it matters. Uh, but for now, just think of the promise of eternal salvation and this reality of living a transformed life. And do what you say and put life behind it. That's all. It's high definition life to me, like the televisions. It's high definition. And remember, faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. So if you're feeling guilty and all that, maybe that's just the Holy Spirit working on you to pull you towards him. But there's no reason. His mercy is new every morning. It's like trading dirt for diamonds. The choice is yours to make. That's why we have free will. He'll never force himself on you. But like I said, you can have as much God as you want. And there's a, there is a difference between just coming to church and being a disciple. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the call for salvation, that's immediate. Boom. You don't work for it, it's a gift. And that gets us to heaven. The call of discipleship, heaven comes to you. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, to Jesus. And he will give you authority as you can handle it. When you're not taking the, the glory for yourself, or you're not taking the glory that belongs to him and building your own kingdom. If you are, he'll put you on the shelf and you'll go through the motions, but the dynamics of the Holy Spirit won't be there. But it's his authority that he works through you and it belongs to him. I had a young man I was working with. He was a skater boy and he was a good looking kid. And he was very popular in high school. And he was very talented. He played guitar and the whole bit and girls love this kid, man. But he, uh, <laughs> he, did some body modifications. He stretched his ears out, but they were so big, he could wrap them around his, I mean, it was crazy. I was like, dude, what are you doing? But that's where he's at. Well, he came here and he went down to the 7-Eleven in Butler. This is a number of years ago, and there was a lot of young kids hanging around down there, and there's a lot of stuff going on. And I guess the Butler police pulled up and they saw him. And he's, you know, he's hopping rails with his skateboard. He's going downstairs. I mean, he's really good. And they called him in. And I don't know if somebody called and said, there's a weird guy around here. I don't know what happened. Um, but they started questioning him. And then he wanted to see his ID. And he said, he goes, Pastor Chuck, you know what I did? I said, what? He goes, I just said, look, I'm working with Pastor Chuck up at the church in the Nazarene. I'm helping him at the Fusion Cafe. And he said, as soon as I said that, the policeman gave him back his ID and he said, have a nice day and take it easy. And he left. <laughs> he had no power that day, but he skated on my name. And not that I'm anything fantastic, but I mean, that's how it works. You know what I mean? Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on heaven will be loosed. And whatever, what, I mean, everything is kind of said and done already. Now, today's the day of salvation, and Israel is back in the land, like we said, 1900, after 1,900 years, the fig tree's blooming again, and this generation shall not pass until the return of the Lord. And all of a sudden, we see all the, I'm not trying to scare anybody, like I said, but all of a sudden, we see all the armies coming towards Jerusalem. It, I was a little scared. I'm you know, going, whoa. I mean, I don't think this is it. I really don't, but you see it all setting up on how it could happen. 
there's something different about the times we live in. Well, you all see it, really. I mean, the culture, everything is very different. Nothing, and like I said last week, nothing's more important than being ready. It, with the virgins, with the oil, five of them weren't ready. So be thankful that you're ready and on the winning side. And I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray it with me. If you have any thoughts that you might not be ready, just pray it with me, okay? So let's pray together. Jesus, I surrender to you. We surrender to you. We believe you were born of a virgin, and you carried a cross for us, and you shed your blood so we could be cleansed and live forever. That we would go to a place where all our tears and worries and problems would be gone forever. I receive your forgiveness right here and now. And I ask you to firmly plant us on the road to everlasting life. I ask you to cause us to will and to do. And I speak a blessing over you with anyone, to anyone within the sound of my voice in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he bless you and keep you and turn his face towards you and be gracious towards you and grant you the peace that we all need. And we pray, Lord, for your return because then we know there will be everlasting peace. And we're praying for everybody over there, Lord, all people involved because it's just a, a horror show. Children are dying, people are dying, and people are in so much pain, it's unbelievable, and there's so much anger. And we know what's behind it, fueling it, but we do pray that it will be a cease and desist soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.